and welcome to the Culture Cast. I'm Chris Dashu, and I am joined by field reporter and host of the Projection Booth podcast, Mr. Mike White. I'm coming to you live on the air. But are you coming to us live outside the Weber House in River Hills Township? No. Damn it. And we are rounding out Horrortober with a look at Chris La Martina's WNUF Halloween special. Don't check your dial, folks. You didn't tune into Transylvania's public access station. No, sir. Tonight is Halloween. Halloween is Satan's night. The night of the devil. Reporter Frank Stewart has a special Halloween treat in store for viewers tonight. He'll be leading a group of paranormal experts to the infamous Weber House. Do you know what happened here in the Weber House? Some people got killed. Their son went haywire. Frank Stewart and his team of experts will conduct the first ever live on TV seance. Evil works in mysterious ways, Frank. It's unpredictable. Are there any spirits in the house? It's scary. <laughs> that, that's far out. That's that far out. Something strange going on in this house. Animal mutilation. Paranormal disturbance. <laughs> the devil worship. Wait, wait, hold on, hold on. This is not stage. Hello? Is this the work of the devil? Folks, we are going where no camera crew has gone before. Father, perform the exorcism. This is not some Halloween prank. The grisly evidence of the supernatural is real. We'll be right back. You're watching the WMUF Halloween Special. The film was released in 2013. Like I mentioned, it's directed by Chris La Martina, along with some other folks who directed the commercials. And it is a found footage mock broadcast that took place in Halloween of 1987. And it features Paul Ferenkopf as a, a smart alecky reporter who goes into a haunted house hoping to scare up the dead. So, Mike, I know you've never seen this before. I am curious, however, what did you think of the WNUF Halloween special? I'd never seen this. I'd never even heard of this before you talked to me about this. I was like, what It's not the- a bad thing. What is he talking about, WNUF Halloween special? What is this thing? I found it on Shudder, just kind of by happenstance last year. So I've been kind of championing this film for quite a while to anyone who's like, found footage fucking sucks. I'm like, eh, I mean, there's a lot of bad movies out there in found footage, but here are a couple good ones you should check out, including this one. Well, then I posted that I was watching it yesterday, and my friend Skiz writes to me this morning. He's like, why are you watching WNUF? My, uh, my friend Chris directed that. I was like, Oh, okay. And <laughs> so it's like, uh, and then as I'm looking at some of the credits, I was like, oh, I know some of the people in here. And then other people were posting on my Facebook as well, like, oh, yeah, I'm the dude with the mullet in that picture. And I'm like, wow, okay. So talk about a weird small world. Um, yeah. And I had, this had completely flown under my radar. Never heard of it. And I'm very glad that you have me on this episode because I'm really glad that I watched this. This was, uh, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, that's kind of the the highest praise I can give it. I mean, outside of being good is it is a lot of fun. And it also really, it, it reaps the benefits of what it kind of sets down. It, it really goes out of its way to make you feel like this is a piece of footage from the 80s. And it does a really good job of giving you that sense of time and place. And if you're familiar with kind of public broadcasting from the 80s or even 90s, really, I mean, this is 87, so it's verging on the 90s. Uh, You know, it has a very distinct sense of time and place. And I think that that really works in the film's favor because, you know, when you fully commit to this idea and it pays off, it really comes through on screen. Well, yeah, it came out in, what, 2013? was made to look like it was 1987, but it's not Kitsch Factor 1987. It's not Stranger Things 1987. It's not all the the good stuff, the fun stuff that we remember. It's not like, hey, look, at it's the freaking Goonies, those kind of things. It feels so much more authentic than 1987 as interpreted by the early to mid, you know, 
by 2013 standards. What's the thing about the 80s at this point is it's kind of been overdone. And 2013, we were a little before that. But now, I mean, everything with the 80s is just fucking Stranger Things and it. And it's like, oh, my God, like, this is so played out. But like you said, I mean, this is not this isn't that. And I think that in my mind, that's why this works so well is because it's really tapping into something that is 80s, but not, you know, bash you over the head, pop culture kind of mainstay stereotype 80s right now i used to work at a cable station now this it seems like this is being set at a uhf station so differences there rather than cable 1987 yeah cable was definitely around but the way that they keep touting that this is channel 28 i just keep thinking you know like we had wxon channel 20 here in detroit and still do somewhere on the dial. Who knows where the hell that ended up? Uh, definitely not at channel 20 on the cable box. I'll tell you that. Um, so it, it has that, that, that cheap UHF kind of thing going for it, but it was really bringing back as far as all the commercials go. It was really bringing back my days in 94, 95, 96 working at a local origination store station and helping produce some of those commercials. So there, it really brought a warm spot to me as far as how these commercials looked and how they were integrated into um, the broadcast. And then also seeing how the commercials repeat and the way that they um, got more risque as the night went on as well was fantastic. And I just love that there was actual thought put into that kind of stuff. And you could tell as you're watching it that somebody actually planned out a lot of this stuff. I also like that it's in four by three aspect ratio. Oh, yeah. Again, it's just and that's the thing. And I'm. Um, I spoke not only with director Chris Lamartina, but I also spoke with Paul Ferencoff, who plays Frank Stewart. So um, I, I have to give them both credit for really Paul Ferencoff really kind of embodying that 80s TV show kind of reporter. But at the same time, Chris Lamartina for really committing to this idea, even to the point of four by three aspect ratio, releasing 300 copies of it on VHS initially before it ever came out anywhere else he just kind of self-released it all over the place and people found it in like bargain bins and stuff and, and that's crazy and that's one of those things where it's like this is a really smart way of releasing something like this because you know while you can tell the longer it goes on that it's not real if you found this just in a bargain bin when this originally came out before there was any kind of online chatter about it you might think it's real Oh, yeah. Yeah, the way that he described it on the audio commentary, like just writing on the spine WNUF Halloween special and hiding it in like a Goodwill shop. And it's like, wow. Okay. And you could, because you would see that. You would see people's home videos inside of Goodwill a lot of times. And it's like, I don't know who, I never was adventurous enough to pick up that. I wanted to buy some people's home movies once, but never uh, ended up doing that. Uh, I thought that would have been a hoot. But yeah, just buying someone's used VHS taped off of TV. Now I would kill for that because I would love to see that kind of stuff. And just that it's this time capsule and the way that they made it into a time capsule is fantastic. And I, I especially love the idea of them uh, as you're watching it, the person who's doing this like tape to tape dubbing, it looks like that they're fast forwarding through bits of it. And that sets up an interesting angle as well, as far as what's important, what's not important. And like, you know, I kind of would have liked to have seen the weather report, but I get to see a few seconds of it. And there are a couple of commercials where I would have liked to have seen more. And then I'm thinking they shot all this stuff just to fast forward through it. It kind of reminds me, like I just recently talked uh, with Adam Rifkin about uh, director's cut and there's so much stuff that they fast forward through in there. And it's like, you had to shoot all this just so you could fast forward through it. And watching some of those commercials again, I was just like, wow, they just, they went nuts with this stuff just to fast forward through these things. Well, again, I think that, like you said, you know, it has an interesting angle that I think really is unique about the end of the film. And we'll talk spoilers kind of when we get to it, but that'll probably be the last thing we talk because honestly, this is one of those things that's best left 
unexplained. You just kind of put it on because I we were having a Halloween party over the weekend and we were all kind of hanging out drinking, playing some board games and I just put it on and I mean immediately people were drawn to it because it's just one of those things where I mean this is unlike anything I've ever seen really. I mean there are close analogs but it's one of those things where either you get it or you don't but if you get it you're drawn to it immediately and you, you you're hooked Two seconds in. Yeah, as I was watching this, I kept thinking of Ghost Watch and seeing these things as being very parallel, but at the same time, very different in the way that they're being presented. And I think that you couldn't do Ghost Watch. You know, we talked about that, that Ghost Watch was, what, 92? And it was okay for the UK at that particular time. I don't think that you could have done anything like Ghost Watch in 92 over here, and definitely not in 2013 over here. So I think the best you're going to get um, is WFUF, uh, WNUF Halloween special, um, because it plays with the medium so much. Well, and that's, like you said, that's the thing about it. I think that this is, you know, we talked about when you were on the Ghost Watch Culture Cast, we talked about kind of how would you do that now? And I think that this is the answer to that question. How do you do something like Ghostwatch in the 21st century? And it's mimicking something from a time that people are inherently familiar with, but also doing it in a way that's slick and really forward thinking and really smart. Precisely, yeah. I mean, I think now the closest you're going to get is like if you put people on some sort of weird scavenger hunt going through the internet and going through like YouTube videos and these kind of things. Like we kind of did something like that when I was working at uh, an advertising agency and we were doing a tie in from uh, Jeep to uh, the TV show lost. And there was this whole thing of like, figuring out like there was the whole um uh there was well there was the degrees of the com- uh, degrees of the compass and we kind of turned that into the 108 as far as the numbers went when it came to the numbers on lost and if you went to this particular website and you clicked at 108 degrees and it l- allowed you entrance into this and it just was one back door after another after another to the point where one of my coworkers accidentally left his own email address inside of uh, one of the test things that they were doing for this site and he ended up starting to get emails from these rabid lost fans just like well what is this and what does this mean and what does this mean and <laughs> Luckily for him, he's an author, and his book actually saw a little bump in sales because people were thinking, oh, there's clues inside of his books. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, you know, this you know, this idea of kind of hiding these tapes in the real world does have a very, like, ARG feel to it. Like, you know, what they did with kind of Cloverfield and, and, and Batman, or there was it The Dark Knight that did that, I think. They did kind of an ARG thing. But... I would say this is better than both of those movies <laughs> combined. You know, and it, and that's and that's the thing is like we've been talking about like fully committing to this idea is the only way that this works. I mean, I have sitting on my shelf one of the VHSs. I went out of my way to buy it. Um, it wasn't cheap, and I'm glad I bought it because there's only one of 300 that exist. And I mean, if I handed it to someone, they would be like, "This, where, how old is this fucking thing?" But I mean, it's only from like five years ago. But it, again, it's going the distance to sell the idea completely. Really pays off, and it pays off with the community of people that watched and loved this movie. You know, Chris Amartina is working on a sequel right now. He's looking for funding, and if you go on Twitter. Um, some notable folks that have been really kind of vocal about it are uh, your buddy over at Red Letter Media that you've had on your podcast a couple times. Jay Bowman. Yeah, and then um, Henry Zabrowski from the last podcast on the left, one of the internet's top listened to podcasts, in, you know, period, was retweeting about it. So, I mean, it's hitting the right notes for the right folks, and these folks are the ones that are really excited and want something and needed something like this. And again, I think that's a testament to what Chris created with this film, is that 
it it's just he somehow managed to find every right person who would be in this that committed to it and understood exactly what they needed to give to the performance down to even you know the the actor and actress who play the the news anchors who are kind of only in the first like third of the film and they completely get it then you've got the the really awkward producer in the van thing and it's like everything about this just works and it's like it's it's almost kind of a miracle that it works so well because it really could have stumbled and been just kind of one note oh yeah the the producer in the van uh deborah she was fantastic that like caught like deer in the headlights look that she gives so often and then those crazy what wait no it was it deborah in the van no, it's was veronica it? stanzi veronica the thank you and she's got that look on her face and those freaking eyebrows man those are amazing yeah the, the the part where she's like we need to cut to commercial uh let's play this part with dr stanley allen's kids for candy trade back thing and then she gives like the most awkward smile oh and it's yeah like, but it's but it's great because again it just it gives you the sense and time and place and exactly what you would expect if this were real exactly and playing the exact clip that we saw earlier in the footage was fantastic i was so happy about that because that's exactly what you do you have something that's already been played that's just kind of still there in the machine and you can go to it easily because you have no freaking idea what's going to happen yeah and you know it's it's very kind of geraldo in the vault-esque uh you know it's kind of that it's a little bit exploitative what frank stewart is kind of on scene at the weber household to do is very geraldo in the vault similar to Ghostwatch, obviously right i mean and that's kind of it shares its dna with Ghostwatch. but again Ghostwatch is one of the best things i've watched all month and again it's in the top five top three top two found footage reality horror films that i can think of and that's because it does really get it right when it comes to giving you something that's not only interesting but also convincing. And I'm not sure how con- in, I'm not sure how important being convincing is in reality, but in my mind, if you're going to do this, you have to be convincing. Even if it's like, well, we know this is fake, but at least it's convincing. The one thing that we didn't talk about when we talked about Ghost Watch was the scene of the daughter knocking on the walls and kind of being a fake inside of the middle of this haunting. And it's like, well, was all of it fake? Probably not. But what elements were fake? And that really comes into playing in WNUF even more, which I think is very clever that it's like we so many of the things that happen happen off screen so it's like well how much of this stuff is real how much of it you know what is is haunting what ends up being the twist of the movie later on and when is all fakery based on the part of this news quote-unquote news station you know what 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 part of these broadcasts are being manipulated by the people that are actually producing them well, and that's and that's the thing that I again I I asked Chris about, and you'll hear me ask him about it in the interview. And I always got the sense, and I'd be curious your interpretation that the house is haunted, but at the same time, when the burgers are talking about the bad spirits in the house, she's unknowingly talking about just the the twist that ends up happening at the end. She's unknowingly right. talking about what ends up happening, as opposed to talking about entities. But in my mind, there are entities as well, if that makes sense. Yeah, there could be. I mean, that's the thing that I like about it is we don't know. Right. And that's what that's what makes it fun. And and you know, you could also go the route of is Frank Stewart in on this because obviously towards the end there's kind of another revelation about one other kind of aspect of the film and he's in on that. So the question is how much was he in on? How much is he not in on? And again, like you said similarly to Ghost Watch, it's like a hoax within a hoax. Right. Right. How much of a Geraldo is this guy? How much does he want these ratings? And I love that he's this such a salty character, you know, just because I didn't get that at first when I was watching it. And then after a while, I was like, wow, this guy is really cynical. Like at first I thought it was that kind of like jokey kind of thing. But then I noticed that he was biting a little too hard on that stuff. And I was just like, oh, okay. And he's not in the newsroom. He's out in the field. It's freaking cold. He is not happy about this. This is not his moment to shine. He is not happy about having to do this segment, which makes it 
even nicer. And yeah, the, the Paul Ferenkov plays it so well because I think we all have newsmen like this in our local news you know, chapters, and he just hits all of those things. He's the one that got passed over the promo- for the promotion to the main desk. Exactly. And so now he's just the schmuck out in the field doing, you know, the fluff personality pieces about the woman who has the biggest bell pepper in the county or something like that. And, right. And this is kind of just a lark just like that. But obviously it ends up, you know, he ends up getting embroiled in something that is clearly not a lark and yeah. ends up being really really kind of the end of the movie is pretty rough oh yeah um, but uh well let's let's take a quick break we'll play the interview that i did with chris lamartina the director and then we'll play the interview i did with paul Ferenkopf, who played frank stewart play some commercials in between them and when we get back we'll finish up talking about the film what was your inspiration for creating the wnuf halloween special so it started, um, it, it's sort of funny. We've done, mm, I think, eight features now. And um, back when we were doing WNF, it, it was it was the first summer in like a year or two years that we weren't making a, a horror comedy. And um, I kept thinking like, man, like I really want to do a, another horror movie this year, but I just don't know how I'm going to do, do one fast. And I started toying around with the idea of doing a found footage movie. Um, I had worked on this film that Ed Sanchez, uh, the Blair Witch co-creator, had made called Lovely Molly, and I was shooting a lot of content, producing a lot of content for their social media campaign, and they are sort of like the, 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 the guys that created um, what they call transmedia, like story extension, and I fell in love with this idea of, of, of world building, um, and I started thinking about how they did that, and then I was thinking about how to make a feature very fast, and I kept thinking, like, it, a found footage movie makes the most sense, right? And I started thinking about, like, what would it mean for me to make a found footage movie, um, knowing that I really don't like many found footage movies. And I wrote a list of all the things that I hated about found footage movies, <laughs> um, just to sort of, like, use that as a jumping off point. Like, how will I do that differently, right? So, so I'm curious, what are the things you hate about found footage movies? <laughs> I will tell you. <laughs> uh, please so, do, because I'm assuming your list is probably very close to what mine is. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. So we'll start with the idea of... Uh, there, there were there were three ones, right? Three big ones that stick out. One, sound footage for me always kind of screwed with my head because there there has to be a believability into how someone is um, finding this movie, right? Like the second you buy a DVD at a store with a UPC code on the back of the box, it's not really sound footage. It's already ruined for you. Um, I mean, obviously you can buy into the conceit of the story, but like the, the discovery in the format was very important to me. Um, so that was something that stuck in the back of my head. Two, the idea of so many found footage movies as you're watching them that you're like, why, why is this filmmaker still filming despite all this crazy stuff happening? Right. Um, yes. Like literally it's, it's one of those things where it's like, um, you know, if somebody dies or some messed up thing happens, there's no reason why you'd keep filming if you were a, a normal human being. <laughs> um, even, if, <laughs> and then the third thing for me was, it was always sort of, um, I, I, while I'd love to make what I would consider a, a bottle movie, like one location, that's what typically gets me bored. Like I, I have a short attention span and, uh, I have a, um, I, w- I would, it would drive me nuts when it was just a found footage movie where one location, three actors, and it's just like mostly just like them running and screaming or crying or things like that. And, um, so I, I wrote this list and I started thinking about stuff and I, you know, I, um, I grew up, um, you know, making low budget horror movies. I've been ma- making short films since I was like 11 and I worked in local television for a while. So I, I was always attracted to sort of really bad local TV. Like there's something about it that reminded me almost of like, um, I love see- seeing what people do with limited resources, like almost like the video equivalent or the filmmaking equivalent of like punk rock where like, Oh, I love what people do with, you know, the equivalent, the video equivalent of three chords. Right. <laughs> um, so I started thinking about that and I started thinking about these questions I had or my problems I had with found footage. And I started thinking first and foremost, okay, like why does someone, why does someone stop? Well, actually, let me backtrack for a second. Okay. I, I at the same time, there was this, a, a resurgence of, um, VHS culture was just, just, just starting. Like everybody was like, like, you know, talking about video again, um, shot on video movies, 
um, things being released only on VHS. Like this was just, just when this was starting to happen. And I thought that was really cool. At the same time, people were making all these 1980s horror movie parodies, but they weren't getting the, um, the, the aesthetic right. Like it was too jokey. And that sort of broke my heart because I legitimately love shot on video movies and I legitimately love like, um, you know, local TV. It's not just, I'm making fun of them. I love that stuff. Right. So I started thinking about this. This was all sort of gestating at that point. And, um, I, I, th I thought about like, okay, the conceit of a found footage movie, why is this person filming? Right. And I thought, okay, um, what if they, they keep filming because they, they have to keep filming because if they stop filming, there's nothing to show on TV. And if there's nothing to show on TV, you don't have ads like at revenue and you lose your job. Right. So people are literally filming because that's their livelihood. They're, it's, it's part of like, they have to film, they have to film or they lose their job. Right. So that was the first answer to that question. The second answer to that question was, and this is something people, a lot of people don't like about doing UF. It's, it's my favorite part of the movie, to be honest with you. Um, I thought about the idea of breaking up the monotony and making sort of a larger universe. Well, I thought if I made it as if somebody actually taped this off of TV, there would have to be commercials. And I didn't want to do what I've seen where somebody puts like one commercial in and it's just a cute little nod. If this was going to really be believably or at least believably enough a found footage movie, I would have to make 30 minutes of commercials and I haven't done the actual number count, but like there's definitely at least 20 minutes of commercials in that movie, you know, in an 82 minute movie. <laughs> um, so like I, and I did that to break up the story, to introduce a larger universe. Like you have stories that exist in the film, like the guy running for, um, uh, you know, governor or, or um, the set, you know, the, like the two guys running for governor, you have the dentist that comes back in different package segments. We did that because it was about creating mythology. And then finally, the third thing was the idea of how can you see this movie? When we first released WNUF, it was only available on VHS for the first first three months it was available. You could only get it on VHS. And when you bought it, it was literally, you would get a VHS tape with a handwritten spine label that says WNUF Halloween Special. Um, when we, before we signed the distribution agreement, my then girlfriend and I, um, now wife, um, we drove around. I mean, we, we left VHS copies of the movie at thrift stores. Um, we went to horror conventions and left copies of the tape in bathrooms. Um, the goal was to have somebody stumble across this and find it and be like, what the hell is this crazy movie? Is this real? Um, my, my favorite story in regard to that is um, some kids I knew in Ohio, and this is really funny. The only reason why they figured this out was because one of the kids actually knew me through the punk scene. My buddy, um, my buddy, buddy Pat lived in this house with some punks and some kid was like, I found this tape in the basement. It's just labeled WNUF Halloween special. And he puts it on and everybody thinks it's legitimately from the eighties. Um, and it wasn't about five minutes into the movie before they realized, Oh my God, I know the guy that made this. Um, so like, that's my ideal way for someone to find the movie. Someone thinking it's real. I think that's one of the things about it that works for me the most is the kind of punk rock aspect to it. Mm -hmm. And the way you distributed in it. Mm -hmm. I actually own one of the copies of the VHS. So. I know. That's incredible. <laughs> yeah, I had, I, let me put it this way. I, I definitely spent some money on it to get it. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I was the only one I've ever seen on eBay. And yeah. I own it. Now I just have to, one of my buddies was giving me a hard time. Now I have to go track down a VCR to watch it. <laughs> That's so funny, man. Okay. Yeah, so well, I'm one of the 300 lucky people who owns it on VHS. Well, and it's funny too, man, um, what you just said about having to get a VCR to watch it. I had a review probably maybe the, probably the first couple months we released it where somebody said, you know, I had to dust off my VCR. I had to get, go in my closet, dust off my VCR, plug it in, and it was sort of like – it was like, it was, um, it's, I think their, their full quote was WNF is not so much a movie as it is an experience. And I think that's something that's really important to say because, um, you know, a lot of movies don't stand out that uniquely like that. Like there's plenty of slasher movies where they're great movies, but it's pretty formulaic. I mean, there's very few things like WNF. Um, you know, I think in recent years, like what, um, like was it dude, Bro Party Massacre um, that came out and has has a similar um, it's way more jokey but it has commercials um, but we we were the first um, and you know it's 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 I I like that part about the story it's truly whether you like it or you hate it um, it's definitely unique yeah no I w I would completely agree I mean I 
I ended up watching it first on Shudder. Okay, and yeah, I yeah. went out of my way to buy the the WNUF VHS, the the the, the proper way to watch it. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, like I said, I still haven't watched it on VHS, so I, I I can't speak to that from a from a viewer standpoint. But seems like everyone who's watched it on VHS kind of comes to the same conclusion. So I, I'm kind of curious. You know, you you went out of your way to make it, you know, on vintage stock, vintage right. tape stock. Yeah, doing all this on VHS in, in your mind, you know, was is it worth it in the finished product? Oh, without a doubt. L- let me let me clarify this. Um, I have never had more fun making a movie than we did when we made WMF. Um, one thing that's really interesting is, like, obviously now everybody shoots on HD or 4K or whatever. It's like a 16-9 image. But I grew up making movies for three aspect ratio, right? Like, when I first started making movies, my family camcorder was like a VHSC um, JVC camcorder. And there was sort of this weird romantic element to when we shot the movie, I'd be like, Oh, I, I, I turned on the camera thinking I was going to frame for a, a rectangle image. Right. But no, it's a square. And that was fun. But also it was fun to like, there's moments when like, you know, someone's performance is a little awkward and it's perfect. You know, like it's sort of, I didn't, I wanted people to be earnest and sincere in what they were doing, but I didn't want them to be over the top unless their character themselves were over the top. And it was very liberating in that regard. And I, I kind of want to ask you more about that because all the commercials were done by friends of yours, people that you know, I'm assuming. So it's, it's kind of funny. There's about, um, I want to say three to five people who did commercials. Um, it's not, and I don't want to get this wrong. Like I can go down the list. Like, um, my buddy Scott made King of Castle Lane. Um, my friend Lonnie made the second you see of the mouse commercial. Um, my, uh, my buddy Jim Branscombe made the parents against partying, but a lot of those commercials were, were me. Um, or, or I had some hand in them. Um, my buddy Scott Jones made the Phil's carpet warehouse. He like, he is Phil. Um, and then, um, like I, I edited a lot of commercials myself but the writing was mixed up on the commercial. Like I, I had about four or five um, uh, writers helping me craft that stuff. Like I actually would have people come over to my house. We'd go through footage I had shot that I was trying to figure out some stuff for or um, uh, royalty-free stock footage video that we had or public domain video, and we'd write content to that. Like I'd sort of say, I have this footage. I'd like to do a 80s sci-fi kids show. And then, you know, my buddy Pat Stork wrote a bunch of them, and he, he came with Galaxy Pilot. Um, but it was, it was very collaborative. And I think that's the point. Like I wanted it to be collaborative. Like I wanted, I didn't want it to just be like, um, I, I knew that if I wrote everything myself, it would start feeling like one person wrote everything, you know? Um, but, right. I, but, but like, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I will say this without, without being like a uh, control freak cause, cause I don't want that to come off this way. I definitely had my hand in, in the majority of of what the um of what was ends up in the movie. Well, hey man, it's your baby. Yeah. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. It's, it's your baby, <laughs> man. You got to make sure it's uh turns out the way you want it cuz otherwise it's not uh no, I I I completely I completely understand. So, the end of the film is I think one of the more unique aspects of it because it subverts the expectations of the found footage genre. Like you talked about at the beginning, how do you find the found footage is one of the big questions. So, kind of Walk me through how you kind of came to the the ending in the version that's in the film, and how that why that was important to get it in such a unique and really distinct way. Sure. So, um, fair, fair enough. And I'm going to try to do this without totally blowing the ending. If somebody discovers the movie through this way, so um, first and foremost, I think by the time I mean hell, I think by the ten minute mark, if not sooner, um, you realize the movie is obviously fake. Um, I don't think anyone's going to watch that movie and think it's real, obviously. But for the first couple minutes, you get it sort of like gets you in that universe, and it's like, all right, we're in this universe, and this is this is the aesthetic. This is the sort of um, this is sort of the other dimension, 1987, right? <laughs> um, but uh, the ending itself was for me the movie thematically had a lot of to do with the perception of reality. Like, you know, is this 1987 or is this 2013, right? Um, are these ghosts or is this something else? Like, you know, all, the idea of, I mean, even the idea with a priest character, when you see the movie, you'll know what I'm talking about when he sort of has this sort of like third act reveal about his, about, you know, who he is. Um, there, there's things there where, um, it's really about like what media in the 1980s was. And, and I think media today still too, like the, the, what you're projecting in media versus what the, the actuality of something is. Right. Um, 
And I think I'll leave it there without going too crazy, but I will say about the idea of the tape. I think when at that point in the movie, when you're watching the tape, you're not just watching anybody's tape. You're watching the tape of somebody that, you know, <laughs> taped over something at the end. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Well, and again, that, that for me is what makes the ending such kind of a, it's so unique and interesting is that it, it really does go out of its way and you went out of your way to make it uh, kind of, a gut punch at the end. I think, I think gut punch as opposed is like, to just leaving. Yeah. It. I think a gut punch is a good way to describe that because let's be honest, totally. And I still stand, it's a horror comedy, right? But, um, that is a very serious scene, uh, before you go to the epilogue, um, epilogue in quotation marks. Cause it's all sort of, you know, weird. Um, but it's, um, yeah, you know, it's, 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 uh, <laughs> I wanted to tone is this funny thing where like, horror comedy is so often tone is, is, um, is dangerous because it's like, when are you supposed to be laughing? When are you, when are you supposed to be scared? And there's certain, I don't, I don't think WNF is a scary movie by any means, but I do like the idea of someone not knowing really how to react in certain moments. I mean, like when we, you know, when uh, a certain, when a certain pet dies, you know, it's like, Oh, that's, that's an awful, that's not a funny moment, you know? (laughs) Yeah. Well, and that's kind of the other thing that you mentioned when you're talking about the tone of the film, it is, it is very much a horror comedy, but I think because of the way it ends, I think it kind of, it puts some of what was going on in the film into perspective. Mm. And the second time you watch it, cause I, I mean, I've seen it. My God, I don't even know how many times <laughs> at this point. It really, it really kind of, uh, it's really kind of a, the ending is more of a catalyst for the rest of the film. The second or third time you watch it because you're able to pick up on what is right, going right, on yeah, more yeah, yeah. in the film. No, and that, and that makes total sense what you're saying there. I mean, it's, it, it's also just interesting to think about the idea of like, you know, uh, what you want to believe and what you want to believe in. Right. I mean, like there's, I mean, I'm not, um, man, I didn't, didn't expect to talk about like beliefs in this conversation, but like, you know, there are certain things where as a horror fan, I would love to believe in certain things, but I know they're not real or I, or I've like, yet to see convincing proof of it, but it's so funny. I mean, like so much of, um, of media is posturing and presenting yourself in a way that it could be real. It could be genuine. It could be authentic. And I think the shining moments of WNUF are something is authentic in its awkwardness or something is authentic in the fact that you can see the strings or you can see, you know what I mean? Like it just, it's like, it's sort of this moment where you, you become, um, it's sincere without, um, without being self, it's sincere and not self-aware. Yeah. Right. Well, and I also think again, for someone who has seen it only once and it's their first time going through it, when you watch it the first time, I didn't expect certain aspects of kind of the interstitials and the non kind of goings on at the house to come into play. Yeah. Yeah. And that I think is an- that's another really successful misdirection on your. Yes, part. yeah, I appreciate that, man. Yeah, and you know it's um, and we wanted to have fun with that. Like in in my head when we made the movie, I I wanted. It's really funny. There's so much in the movie um, that in my head, I, like I, I I believe, like oh, I know who did this. I know what happened there. I know why this character is motivated to do this thing. But it's not in the movie. But in my head, I have that backstory because that understanding of these characters as real people, as if they were making a local special in 1987, had to be there in order to get the right um, ambiance. You know, like there's moments where I'm like, okay, well, does you know. <laughs> In my head, I think Frank Stewart broke their recording gear, you know, uh, because or he or he hired an intern to do it, right? Because he wanted to get that moment. So there's things in my head where it's like I, I want um, I want to screw with you know motivations to sort of have some of those uh, story beats. Well, and I, and again, I think that that's one of the most successful things about the film is is that kind of sowing the seeds of distrust with the people that are in the house. Right. Because like you said, I mean, there's there's no way of knowing really when you're watching it the first time what really right, is going right. on until that ki- kicker right at yeah. the end. <laughs> no, I appreciate that, man. Yeah. And and, I, and I'm, I'm assuming um, just because we've been talking about it, you're probably going to give a little bit of an explanation of, of what the movie's about before the, before our interview starts, right? <laughs> As someone who's made a found footage film, that the found footage subgenre is kind of a it's kind of like a dirty word in a way. You know, it, it's funny. I feel like found footage is something that almost has become like how people talk about slasher movies in the 1980s. Like you're going to see some great ones, but you're already apprehensive because so many people, so many filmmakers realize they could make a movie easily and get people to watch it. Um, so you're, you sort of keep them at arm's length because 
oh man, somebody just shat out a movie, you know? <laughs> I mean, like, I, 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 well, that's kind of what it feels yeah, like. Yeah, because, because people know, oh, I can shoot a found footage movie in two days, right? Um, I mean, honestly, I think we probably did the most, like, ass backwards way of making a found footage movie. I mean, um, even though it only took us, um, I think, it was, God, I can't remember how many shooting days it was. It was, it was, I think it was like, it was less than 10 shooting days, but then it was like, at least principal days, um, but then it was months and months of editing, right? Um, because we were doing all these commercials. But I was going to say, I mean, like most sound footage movies, you could do one. In, I mean, you could do a sound footage movie in, in six hours if you have your shit together, right? Um, and I think that's dangerous because a lot of people, I mean, that's the problem with the horror genre in general. Business people, and I think I should say business people in quotation marks, see, oh, horror film is the most profitable genre. I'm just going to like make a, a bullshit like killer in a house movie for two grand and then I'll put it on VOD. And that's, that's, I think that's upsetting. And I think sound footage is the easiest way of doing an easy, and I say easy again in quotation marks, easy genre. Horror is the most accessible genre to, to make your investment back as a, as a filmmaker. Um, which is also ironic because, you know, I don't make my living making horror movies. I mean, WNUF, uh, without saying numbers, I'll say I'm off, off the podcast, but like, um, uh, you know, it's, it hasn't, it hasn't been a very, uh, insanely profitable movie compared to the number of people who have seen it. At the same time, I'll go to a bar at a horror convention and I'll tell somebody I made it and then they'll pay for my tab for the rest of the night. Like, just cause they know the movie, you know, it's, it's just kind of, it's kind of weird. Like, I didn't make it to make money. I did it because I just wanted to make a, a fun, weird horror movie. And I think that's the thing that's that's the most important part about it. Well, and again, I mean, unlike something like, say, the Poughkeepsie tapes where it was made in a studio yeah. setting and it essentially languished in development or release hell for like over a decade. Well, it, it, it's really funny, man. You bring up because I just saw that. Because I'm, I'm developing this other project. Um, it's been I've been developing it for like three years now, and somebody finally mentioned, "Oh, you should check out the Poughkeepsie tapes," and um, and I finally watched it, and I'm really glad I did because they watching it was like, "Wow, these are all the things I don't want to do with this project I'm developing." Um, because Poughkeepsie tapes, look, I mean, it's it's an interesting idea, but there's so many moments where you're like, "This is not believable at all." <laughs> So, Oof, hating on the Poughkeepsie tapes. A I mean, bit. I'm not. I mean, look, don't get me wrong. Dude, it's a cool idea. Um, yeah, yeah, but I, I under, I understand where you're yeah. coming from, though, completely. Well, because, well, that and that, and again, I, I think it comes back to this interesting conversation about what is found footage yeah. and what is faux documentary, because there are things that kind of toe the line, and I would even, you know, say to some extent that WNUF is it's a mix. I mean, it's not completely found yeah. footage. It's kind of a mix of the two. I, I think that's correct i think it's it, and, and and also i think the, the, the question remains too is a broader discussion of what is found footage you know i mean like right. could could uh-huh. you make a movie that is straight up a movie that's supposed to be from 1980 from the 1980s and call that found footage um i mean what does even what does found footage even mean you know like you could I mean anything you find is footage you found um <laughs> which let's not get too silly there but you know what I yeah mean. well i mean i mean for me found footage is as as a film you know as a film critic i would say found footage is is you know you have a camera and it's in the environment and it's the conceit that someone is filming and that person is taking part in the actions, not as just an observer, like a normal. Yeah. Guy. That's normally what found footage is in my mind. No, that's a fair point. And, and I think, I think then I also start thinking about, um, you know, um, and, I, and I guess this still falls on your definition. I mean, I think about something like unfriended or I just saw this movie. Uh, what was the title? Oh, uh, live scream. This is something that you actually might be interested in, especially since you do like video game stuff as well. Um, it's supposed to be like a, like a role playing, a horror role playing game. And it's a screen capture of someone playing this horror game. I saw that at, um, genre blast film festival. And that was pretty, um, it was a pretty unique, interesting movie. So, I mean, you know, I think about stuff like that, where the sound footage genre, there are so many new stories that could be told that way that it's, um, that I I will give something a shot if it seems unique. You know? We're doing only found footage movies, but the thing I wanted to stay away from was found footage movies that are kind of the I don't know the ones that everybody kind of points a finger at and says that's a found right, footage right right like the main the mainstream ones like I'm not going to do Paranormal Activity because <sighs> I, mean, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't want to shit on I don't want to shit on Paranormal Activity but. That movie's not very good. I'm sorry. It's kind of scary the first time I, you I saw it. that on Halloween night, whenever that whenever year that came out, and I enjoyed it. But there were definitely moments in. The, I mean, and I think it's. I think the found footage part of it is is you know it's passable. There's editing in there that I'm like, I guess someone edited this, right? Um, but 
but I do think the only reason why that one didn't work for me was because there were certain actors that the performance took me out of the movie. Like they felt too actorly. Uh-huh. Um, but I, I do like, I think that movie is pretty, I think it's pretty good for what it is. Um, I mean, obviously my favorite sound footage movie, and I would say this, um, without even being friends with the director. Cause I did, um, when I met him is, uh, years after I'd seen it, I still think Blair Witch Project is like the f- best sound footage. Movie. I like Blair Witch a lot. I, I don't know if Blair Witch is, I think it's aged. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, there's parts of it that, I mean, there's parts of it that don't mm-hmm. work. Uh, for me, my favorite found footage. And again, it's a question of what do we consider found footage? Because I really like ghost watch from the 90s See, it's so funny man everyone always compares wnuf to that <laughs> and i didn't watch that really like, dude yes isn't that insane I-, I mean they're both on i mean is it because they're both on shutter <laughs> is that why because they're both on shutter i'll never forget um somebody told me this recently i didn't know this so um uh adam green has a podcast right he's a hatchet guy and he and somebody would ask him about oh, if you've yeah. seen wnuf and he goes oh is that the movie that ripped off ghost watch and I was kind of heartbroken by that because it's like, dude, like, if somebody is listening to this, man, this is the worst thing to ever say in a podcast. If somebody's listening to this and you legitimately can't buy my movie, I don't care if you watch it for free or if you watch it at a friend's house. I make movies because I like telling stories, right? Um, the other, the right. film I made after WNF, Call Girls Cthulhu, dude, that was torrented by like thousands of people before it was even released. Like, we got screwed and the distributor got screwed. Um, WNF, I know. Um, thousands of people have seen it and I haven't, it hasn't made a, uh, um, you know, real money for me, but I don't care because like, I don't know, man, I think it's cool. Even look, I made a movie that people watch every October and probably will do that every October. Some people for their whole lives. That's beautiful to me. I mean, I made a movie for $1,500 that people watch every year on, in October. That's, that's living the dream, dude. <laughs> Like, I don't know. Oh, I'm, I'm with yeah. you. I mean, I went out of my way to buy it on VHS, yeah. man. Like, I don't, if it, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, as far as I'm concerned, on your end, like, any anytime anyone says something to that effect to you, I'm sure it's just, like, the, the best yeah. thing ever. Yeah, it, it's, it's a cool feeling. And, I mean, like, you know, it's, I mean, there's so many interesting parts of it. I'll, look, we'll come back to this in a second, but I do want to say, people compare us to Ghostwatch, and I didn't see Ghostwatch while we, while we were making it. Um, and then I also, I just watched it two years ago, and I'm going to be honest with you, while I think it's a really neat idea, and it's sort of like Orson Welles' War of the World style, I still think, uh, mm-hmm. like, I didn't, I didn't finish it. Like, and I know that sounds kind of crappy, but like I watched it, I was like, oh, this is a cool idea, but I'm, I'm, I kind of lost interest in it because I felt like it t- took too long to get going. Um, and, I, and, and I think that's, you know, that is what it is. And, and, and I do think it's unique and cool, but it, it just wasn't the movie for me. Um, but I will say this, the other thing that's really cool about WF is like, um, there's <laughs> the thing that always gets me is my wife, my, my, um, as I was finishing up editing, she was my, um, uh, girlfriend while we were making, she's the call girl of Cthulhu. If anyone listening has ever seen call girl of Cthulhu, that's how we met making that movie. But she was the, um, the mom in King of Castle Lane, the sitcom. And I didn't know her yet. Like, like my friend Scott made that one, like literally just handed me over a file. And I think I like might've changed, like added a title to it to, to tighten it up. But like, um, so my, my future wife was in WNUF and I hadn't met her yet, which I think is incredible. Right. Like that's just sort of like a weird story to that, to the making of that film. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> it was meant to be. <laughs> it's a lot of synchronicity, right. Just kind of worked out that way. Yeah. So you know, we've we've talked a little bit about the the found footage genre, and we've we've talked about your film. So I, I'm curious because you mentioned already kind of doing the like I guess what it's considered like a a, a whisper campaign. You know, kind of taking the VHSs and leaving them, uh, really kind of seeding the movie out into the public, but doing it in a way that's less noticeable or less publicized. How successful was that in drumming up interest in the film? So- it, it's interesting, and I, and I will t- I'll, I'll, I will respond to your question by going in an odd direction. Um, when we shot WNUF, um, I kept thinking to myself, and and we had made like you know we had made um, God was five features before that. Um, this movie President's Day and this movie Witches Brew, and nobody really gave a shit. I mean, we we would play like you know like any like a dozen festivals, and like you know some people found President's Day and thought it was cool, and um, nobody really reacted too much to Witches Brew. And, you know, we spent a lot of time and I just kept thinking like, dude, if I'm going to make a movie where nobody really cares, I'm going to do the thing I really, really, really want to make. And like, and I kept thinking about the idea of shooting a movie all in standard definition footage and how much I love that. I mean, you know, I don't know, you know, how, how hip you are to filmmaking community, but that was the point where everybody was saying like, oh my gosh, man, he shot that movie on a red camera. He shot that movie 4K. And I kept thinking like, 
I don't care which fucking format or what camera you shot your movie on. Like, I, I care about the story and I care about the idea. So the idea that we're shooting a movie on VHS tapes um, while everyone else was, like, upgrading their resolution was, like, the funniest thing to me. And it was sort of like this, like, punk rock fuck you to it. Um, and it was appropriate. But I remember when we stopped to make the movie, I was like, you know, we're <laughs> nobody's crazy enough to make this movie this way. And that was sort of the answer. Like, we were those crazy nobodies. We had nothing to lose. And that idea of having nothing to lose uh, was great. I think as a filmmaker, expectation becomes your enemy. What people expect from you um, or when people expect something from you, that's when it really truly endangers your, your role as an artist. Like, I mean, you think about John Carpenter or somebody like that now, right? John Carpenter is not just making his next movie. He's making the next John Carpenter movie. And every time you go to see one of his films, you're going to compare it to The Fog, you're going to compare it to The Thing, you're going to compare it to Halloween, because that's built up in your head. And we didn't have that. We literally got, I got to make something that was just like a kid in a candy store. I'm going to do whatever I want. And if you don't like it, that's cool. I didn't make it for you. Uh, but obviously it's not his audience because people realized I was that in love with the material. And, and I'm, to, to answer your question originally, when we... <laughs> We didn't know if people were going to find these tapes, right? For all I knew, uh, you know, like if I put that tape in the hard, that the hard convention bathroom and a janitor came in and threw it in the garbage, that's possible. I mean, maybe, you know, maybe the weeks I spent dubbing VHS tapes, VCR to VCR, maybe that was in vain. I don't know, but I don't think it was because I think about growing up when I would go through the $2 bin at Woolworth or I would um, uh, find a, like my favorite, like, like punk rock uh, CD in a, in a um, thrift store. Those discoveries, I mean, that's why we love the horror genre. Like, like, you know, what's in the darkness? We don't know. And that discovery of finding that thing is, is the best part of the genre sometimes. So, and I think that was the mythology that sort of helped us. It, this movie has to exist with the whisper campaign. Right. And, um, and, and like, you know, I mean, like we were really fortunate too, because of the VA, VHS research that was coming at the time, um, the New York times had done a story about, shot on video horror film coming back and um the guy named eric pippenberg he um he had done he had done that story and pop cinema was who, uh, who originally put out the um the vhs tape release they sent a copy to eric and eric covered the movie for the new york times and from the new york times article other media outlets sort of took hold of it um so and that you know that we we're really lucky i mean like i was on npr um on a show called here and now that year because of that um and then like you know mtv covered it not on on the tv but online and um a couple other bigger sites that I was like, frankly shocked. Um, my favorite one was I did an interview with Vice, um, where the, the guy who did the interview was, I guess he was a little drunk when he saw the movie because he talked about how for like the first ten minutes he wasn't sure if it was real or not, and he was having like this internal monologue with himself, which I thought was incredible. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. If I had found it in a bathroom, I'm not sure I would have known if it was real or not. Yeah, no, right? I, I'm with you. Well, and it's sort of funny. Like I like I think that idea s sprung from um, man. I'm t this is the real secret sauce. Um, years ago, years ago, I was at a horror convention. Um, I think it was horrifying in, in Baltimore. And there was a, there was a brown box, like a brown cardboard box with a bunch of VHS tapes inside. And I was like, what the fuck is this? So I took one and I put it in my VCR when I got home and it ended up being a promo for the ring. And it was the, it was the tape in the ring. Um, so that was sort of like this funny thing where I was like, I, that sort of stuck in the back of my head. Um, but of course it ended with the trailer for the ring. Right. So it was a great marketing tool, but I ended up making a whole movie around that, you know? Um, but it's funny. I, I it's funny. That was in my uh, subconscious. I haven't thought about that until we talked about it just now. So man, that's what I was channeling. <laughs> well, and again, I mean, you know, like you said, kind of really doing some world building and some world creation, doing that, leaving those tapes really helps kind of build the mystique around it. But I mean, again, I, I can't give you enough praise for really going for it. Like you said, I mean, one commercial would not have cut it, right? It really had to, you really had to go for it. And I think it, like I say, it really comes through. Well, and I think that's what's tough. I mean, like some people, I think a lot, a lot of younger audience, I mean, like you grew up watching, you know, TV and, and taping things on TV, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Um, I, um, there's, there's a disconnect where some people are like, there's too many commercials. And I'm like, did you watch television as a kid? Because that's how it was. It wasn't, it wasn't your five second skip ad, man. It was like, you were like, all right, I guess I'll t go take a piss, you know, or I guess I'll go like grab another soda or beer or whatever. Um, hopefully where people aren't children drinking beers, but you know what I mean? Um, but it was like, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, um, it had to be that way or it's not believable. And, and if, and if, if that was the fun I had to create at the sacrifice of making a traditional feature, you know, boo fucking who, I mean, like I didn't want to make a traditional feature. Well, and again, I mean, if someone's complaining about the amount of commercials, my response to that is, is do you, like you said, did you, not, do you not watch TV now? Yeah, exactly. I mean, again, it's, it's further kind of reinforced 
traversing this world that this exists within. And, yeah, 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 for sure. So I, I want to ask you a little bit about it being on Shutter and mm-hmm. kind of has that drummed up a lot more interest? Do you notice more people coming up to you, reaching out to you and talking to you about it, wanting to talk to you about it since yeah, it's on the, Shutter? What's weird about WNUF is it's um, it doesn't die. It, it, the, the sort of cult around the movie grows every year. Um, like, I, you know, for um, – uh, for for this month for October, um, I'm going to be traveling to what four different screenings. Uh, I'm going to be in down in Raleigh for a VHS festival. I'm going to be in Lancaster, Pennsylvania for a screening, and uh, they're showing it in DC on Halloween night. Um, so, and then there's one other one that I'm forgetting. I'm being terrible. Anyway, what I was going to say was um, it's. It's it's weird because you know people um, the Shutter thing yes people absolutely are watching it on Shutter but I mean I remember for a while people didn't know how to see it so like people were doing things like they they go on eBay and and try to like find copies or or torrenting it like crazy I mean I'll tell you this too this is true uh, it might even still be up there when we were giving away the VH, we were throwing throwing the VHS tapes out the car window and in bathrooms and whatnot we uploaded uh, a, a version on Cinemageddon. Uh, you know, the, the torrenting site. And we, we, my buddy Charlie posted it and, um, he, um, uh, he, he posted it with this blurb. I said, you know, my, my, my godmother, Lulu, uh, taped this off of local TV back in the eighties. It's one of, one of the craziest things I've ever seen. Um, so like we would, we encourage people to find it that way. The cool thing about shutter is it makes it more accessible. And like, you know, I was really lucky. I was one of the shutter labs, um, fellows the first year they did the shutter labs program. Um, and it was, it was pretty, uh, it was pretty cool. Those people are really great folks. They're really smart curators of what horror is. And it's frankly, it's, it's, it's an honor to be part of the shutter collection because that is without a doubt, the best streaming service for horror. Um, Netflix has been, has gotten awful and Amazon isn't, isn't choose, choosy enough. You know, Netflix is awful. And Amazon, am, the way I describe Amazon instant video to people is it's like the, it's like the bin at Walmart. Yeah. Like, you got have no idea what's going to be in there. Well, and then, and then you really have to hunt because like, I find that like the first six pages of Amazon horror stuff, I'm like, okay, that's, that's fine. Like there's a couple ones that I actually want to watch, but you have to find that one you want to watch and then see more like this, like four more times. You have to go down like an Amazon hole before you actually get to the stuff that you're like, oh shit, like this movie's on here. All right. Or, or like, I remember VHS tapes, I would scour video stores when I was a kid for are now streaming on Amazon for free. Like, you know, there's, there's movies that I probably would have paid $50 for, for a VHS tape in like 1996 or 1997. And now I can stream them. Well, for and free, again, like you, know, you said, I 100% crazy. agree with you. I think shutter is the end all be all for horror and horror fans and burgeoning burgeoning um unique and original horror content because they're making obviously their own content yeah well. yeah and, and and i think that that's only going to get better i mean like that's also what's really cool with, with their you know their parent company being amc they've they've got some money that they can put toward bigger and better things um which is really neat um but yeah man like that's been great but every year and i'll, I'll give you some advice for any filmmakers out there you want your movie to have longevity like true longevity have it centered around the holiday because like President's Day, for example, even though it doesn't take place on President's Day, there's people I know that tag me in a post about President's Day every February when, when the holiday hits, right? How, you know, WNF Halloween special, because it is a Halloween film, it becomes part of someone's, you know, rotation for that oct- October, you know, movie screening series. I think that it's like the Christmas story. Exactly. Right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. One day there'll be a channel that just shows WNF for 24 hours. <laughs> So I, I want to I want to ask you. So we we touched on it a little bit already. Film has been out for five years now, yeah. almost five years. It'll be five years a, a month from a month from yesterday. Uh-huh. In those five years, you said that you've noticed the audience has grown. How do you think it's aged in five years? Looking back, there's only a few things I would change looking back, and that's actually the. Um and I can't think of them off the top of my head right now, but there's very few. Um, it's, it's the movie. It's, it's most closely the film I wanted to make in, in all the films I've ever made. Um, and I think part of that is because the cheapness is part of the aesthetic. Um, because, you know, I mean, like, we, I, you know, I made, I, I'm serious. I made WNF for $1,500. Um, Call Girl was about forty grand to make that. And we tried to make something way bigger. And I think there's parts where my least favorite parts of Call Girl are because we didn't have the money or the time to do it correctly. Right. Um, and I think, you know, WNF is, um, when I look back at it, it feels like it, 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 it it's, it's a love letter, man. Like I, I, I made that movie because it's, it's, um, I wanted to, mm, I don't know. I, I don't know if I want to phrase it that way. I, it's how I wanted to make it. And I think it shows that I cared about the source material very much. Like I didn't make that movie ever thinking 
um, people are going to analyze it like that. It's sort of, it's like no fear of failure. Like, you know, if you know, if, if you think, if you don't think something's impossible, you can do it, you know? Well, and again, I mean, for me as someone who grew up on TV and watching TV and I mean, uh, I'm yeah, admitted, yeah. I didn't watch horror movies until I was 16. Um, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, again, no problem admitting it. But I think because you're such a kind of in tune with what you wanted to do, it really shows. And again, you complete, like I said, you completely bought, I completely buy in to everything that goes on in the movie. And it really, like you said, it does show that you are a, a fan of what you are making a film about. Well, and I, I, that means a lot, dude, because like it, you see a lot of movies where clearly the director doesn't like horror movies. Mm -hmm. um, I, I always get really kind of like, not offended. I'm not going to say I'm offended, but I kind of feel a little hurt when I'm at like a film festival and one of the filmmakers says like, Oh, I really just don't like horror movies or like, I never was really into horror movies. And I'm not saying that person has to be into that, but the fact that they're making something without um, an understanding or a true appreciation for the genre, it just kind of, it just kind of feels like just like, um, it just makes why me is sad. horror always single? Um, out is the you know, it's, it, it, yeah, exactly. I mean, to a lot of people, it's like one step above pornography. Uh, which is, you know, <laughs> that's a whole other conversation, but like, um, it's, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's weird because I think horror is such a unique genre that you can do so many fun, imaginative things with. I mean, I think that some of the best directing in movies period is because they got to play with fantastic elements, sort of have fun with the idea of cinematic illusion. Well, and a lot of really kind of, you know, vaunted directors got their start in horror on top of everything else. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and like the, the cool thing about that horror too is, you can, you know, if you make a, if you make a drama about, you know, class warfare, right? It could, it has a, it could have, the, have the tendency to get heavy handed very quick. If you do class warfare in a horror movie, like people under the stairs or something like that, you can have so much fun without having to be like this, like obvious sort of like, you know, like brooding serious film. And not to say there's a place for that stuff. I'm not going to say there's not, it's just like there, there's, there's an elasticity and a, um, uh, a, a a veneer to that stuff that that, that makes it still escapism. No, yeah, that's that's true. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, just think if Get Out wasn't a horror movie, right? That's what I always say. I'm like, just think if Get Out wasn't a horror movie. What? Like, I'm not sure anyone would enjoy that movie as much as everyone loves Get Out. I mean, yeah, I will say this. It would probably be. I mean, Get Out's fucking fantastic. I don't, I don't want to say anything. I think it would be uh, powerful if if it wasn't a horror film. I I don't think. Um, I mean, dude, I, to talk about Get Out for a second, I have never felt the electric fucking energy of an audience cheer, like, in the third act of that movie when, when the main character starts, you know, kicking ass. Like, I mean, I was, I was jumping up out of my fucking feet. Like, it's like, and that, and that exists because you're sort of like, it's, oh my God, it's, it's just like, it's just so intense. And that's, that empathy and that, that sense of danger is something that truly comes from the, from the primal urges of the horror genre. Yeah. I, I'm I'm completely with you. You know, it's it's like you said. It's I I've never understood the the whole idea of distancing yourself from horror. I mean, I I get it in kind of like a subconscious way because horror is unapproachable, I guess, in some respects. Mm. And it you know there are horror movies out there that have gotten a bad rap, justly and unjustly. But at the same time, like you said, I mean, you can do so much more with the horror genre than you can yeah, do with anything sure. else. You can really explore sure. the fantastical elements of stuff. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you yeah. about the sequel. Um, okay, so we are in, in the midst of raising money to make, uh, <laughs> as I'm calling it right now, WNF Halloween sequel. Um, so I'm... So, I'm going to be honest, I said it earlier in the interview, like, I've never had more fun making a movie than when we made WNF. And, like, more and more as I think about it, I've, uh, since then, I thought about how there's so many ideas and some things that I didn't get to explore that I want to explore. The idea of still creating the universe, the idea of, you know, making fake um, video content from previous years. So we're raising money to make a sequel right now, and I want to keep some of the mystique, so I'm not telling people the plot publicly. Um, a couple people privately have, have heard what it's about, um, but uh, very few, and I'm trying to keep that close to the vest because my goal is to have people one day open their mailbox and get the fucking VHS tape and put it in and have a new experience like they did when they saw the original, right? The goal is to literally give them, you know, fill up their trick-or-treat bag with a new weird movie um, that takes, takes place on Halloween. Um, so the three things I'll tell you, and this is in the Kickstarter, uh, in the, um, the crowdsourcing video. Um, one, uh, it's not a remake. It's not a reboot. It is a, it is a, it is a, it is a sequel. 
Um, and you know, somebody's seeing like, how can you, how can you make a sequel to that movie? Well, it's, it's, you'll see how we do it when we, when we do it. Um, but the, um, so it is, it's a continuation of the universe built in WMF. Um, number two, it will take place in the 1990s. It will take place in the mid 1990s. And, um, you know, so it's not going to be totally like 80s style. Like there will be some things that we explore as 90s tropes or as a lampoon of nine media in the 90s. And what, what, you know, American culture was in, in the mid 90s. And then three, there will be uh, a pretty sizable portion of, of returning characters, um, which I think is really exciting. Like, you know, some minor characters, some, some bigger characters. Um, but yeah, man, I mean, like, I, I know in my head every character that's in WNUF, I know what's happened to them, and if it's possible to put them in the sequel, they will be in the sequel. And some of the folks that you think might not be possibly, or might not be possible to be in the sequel, we're still going to find a way to put them in there. <laughs> well, I hope, hope I, so. I just want to see Paul of more of Paul Fahrenkopf. That's why I'm just, he is so believably the dickhead, like, television reporter. I mean, he's a total ass, but in, like, the most, like, journalistic way, which I, which I love. Well, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you about Paul Fahrenkopf. Um, I, I've known him since, uh, this was like 23. He was in our film President's Day. He played a detective. And I love Paul. He's incredible. And, um, he, um, he, I wrote Frank Stewart for him. I, I knew that he was going to play this character. And Frank Stewart's character is based off of um, two people. One is, like, obviously, like, uh, well, I shouldn't say this. This is not true. This is the, 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 the opinions in this yeah, podcast. They're only yours, are man. Only a, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're only mine. Um, I got it's you. Pa- <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's, a, <laughs> it's, I mean, it's, pa- it's partially, you know, Geraldo. There's definitely some, you know, going, going into Al Capone's vault. But then there's this, this Baltimore um, newscaster from the uh, 80s and 90s that he was on a show. Um, oh, man, I got to be careful if I do this. But it's just the one day he'll find this out. Um, long story short, this guy clearly resented the fact that other people were moving up the, sh- the ladder in Baltimore media and he sort of stayed stuck in local TV. So there's certain moments where I channeled that character. And I remember sending links of this guy's radio uh, news show to Paul to be like, Hey, try to like sort of be like that a little bit. Um, but obviously Paul's way more charming. And when Paul auditioned for the movie, um, and he knows this, we've talked about this. He was not good. And I was like, Paul. And I, and he, and he calls me he's like, Chris, I blew it. Like, I'm really sorry. Like, and I was like, Paul, I wrote this movie for you. Like, like, and if I love a character, like if I love an actor and they become family, I will, I will literally tell them, Hey, what's the right role you want to play? I will write a movie for you. Um, and then if we, you know, if the stars line, we'll make it. So Paul sort of, you know, sort of like blew his audition. And I, and I told him, I was like, come back, be arrogant, be smug, do this audition. Like, you know, you have the role, like, you know, I wrote it for you and do it that cocky and arrogant, but do it in a cool way. And, um, he, he came back and he had the second shot and he, and he got it. Like he finally got, it. he was just like, but it was, it was he, at first, I think he was just going to say, Hey, Chris, I blew it. This isn't the right role. And I didn't want him to. Um, and you know, Paul's just, he's just, um, he's an incredible man, really sweet, warm guy. He's not like Frank at all. <laughs> um, I mean, he's funny like Frank, but not like, um, you know, he's not a, he's not a, a jerk. Um, but I was going to say, I mean, and we, we, we've been fortunate to do, um, I don't know if you know about this. We made a, um, a sequel slash prequel spoken word album that came out in 2015 through Terror Vision Records. Um, so Paul re- re- replayed the character for um, a Frank for that. And um, we also used Paul. I shot a promo for Terror Vision released the Unsolved Mysteries soundtrack. And we had Paul sort of be the stand in for Robert Stack for the video promo. In regards sure. to because you've mentioned the budget and I'm again, I'm beyond impressed with working on the budget and I dare to say I feel like a lot I mean some of that must have come from like you said you're you weren't friends with him at the time but you are now the Blair Witch creators I mean they did the same thing right they they kind of really went for it with the low budget and it, it exploded I'm curious when you're coming at the sequel are you coming at it from the same direction are you going to approach it in a more kind of expansive budget. Absolutely. Yeah. It, oh, it, yeah. Without a doubt to be more money. <laughs> um, and I mean, like, you know, the goal is to raise 50 grand. Um, and I'll tell you what that means. Right. So there's a couple things here. WNF, I mean, like that was a hard cost, $1,500. Um, if, if, uh, if we had paid people, if we had, you know, like gotten through, like, like, you know, there's everything in there is, you know, license or it's royalty free or whatever, but it's, there's things that we did because it, it was cheap and it could be forgivable with, with the movie taking place in the 1990s and some of the portions being, um, 
yeah, man, you're getting some secrets out of me. Some of the portions of the sequel, um, it's more like, I mean, commercials in the 90s were more sophisticated, right? So we're going to need, need to be need to invest more in sophistication. Um, you know, there's there's some goals. I'd like to have some animated commercials in there. So that means probably, you know, higher cost for certain things. Um, and I think the idea of, of doing some of the movie um, on basic cable rather than, you know, public like, or local TV, there's things that need to be a bit more sophisticated in production. Um, so, like, you know, like, I, you know, I'm trying to raise 50, 50 grand because it's going to show up on the screen more so. And there's also um, some of the special effects that will be needed are grander. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit after we get off the podcast, a tiny bit of why, why that's going to be the case. But when you see the movie, you're going to understand. And there's some locations I'm going to need that are, uh, that are, that are I'm going to have to pay rental costs. Um, so, you know, and, and then also like, I'm not just, the, the money is not necessarily just paying for the movie. It's going to be paying for making, you know, um, VHS copies in bulk. It's going to be pay for the DVDs that we're going to make, um, that type of thing. So my, my last question to you then is, is what is your time frame looking like for this showing up in people's mailboxes unexpectedly? Sure. So to be totally honest with you, I probably think within two years. Um, so okay. it, 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 it will be, it will be a decent chunk of, of, of waiting. Um, the reason that is, is because some of the crowdsource incentives are you can be in one of the commercials or you can say a line of dialogue in the film. Um, and I need to know how much of that needs to be written into the movie. Like there is like a, like there is a structure to the story and I know what I'm going to do with it, but like, I need to know how many people are, are going to be used in which ways. Um, I've, I mean, to, to be totally honest, I've already produced what, like five of the commercials. Um, so, um, you know, we've been plugging away at them for the, I've been, I've been pulling, uh, stock footage for the last year. So like, I know what I'm doing with this, but I, this, this is the other cool thing. We shot the first WNF script to screen in nine months. I mean, it was, it was done from, from idea to, to completion in nine months. Now granted, I was younger. I didn't have a house. Um, I, my job was not really a career <laughs> at that point. Um, so I want to take my time knowing people are going to wait for it. I want to make sure I get it exactly how I want it. So that's why it's going to be a little bit longer. Have a hunger for horror? A yen for Yelp yarns? Then give your blood-curdled bones a boon and tune in to Chronicles from the Crypt. Join sordid slime slingers Casualty Chris and Father Malone as they take on HBO's groundbreaking television series, Tales from the Crypt. Here's what the rotting and rancid rabble are saying about Chronicles from the Crypt. <laughs> tune in to Chronicles from the Crypt. You have nothing to lose except your life. is Carl Kolchak. He's a reporter. Now that is news, Vincenzo. News! And we are a news paper. We are supposed to print news, not suppress it. With the INS. What's an INS? Independent news servicer founded in 1904 by Enrico Peluzzi. Who seems to have a nose for the strange and unusual. Well, last year in Las Vegas, I uncovered a series of murders that turned out to have been committed by a vampire. And what is the Kolchak Tapes? It's a podcast. All about Carl Kolchak. What's a Kolchak? The Night Stalker. And where can you get it? On iTunes, Stitcher Radio, and at www.kolchaktapes.com. As foolish a game as any that Gory the Ghoul could make up. Here's what some people are saying about the Projection Booth Podcast. Week after week, I'm mesmerized by the focus given great films and questionable films alike. But every episode is a learning and entertaining experience. This is hands down the best movie podcast. They cover so many different genres across so many years, from obscure movies to blockbusters. If there's only one podcast about movies and cinema that you listen to, make it this one. The Projection Booth Podcast, with new episodes available every week at projectionboothpodcast.com. In 1985, a curious phenomenon occurred. The Twilight Zone returned to television, featuring all new tales of mystery and imagination from the minds of Ray Bradbury, Harlan Ellison, George R.R. R. Martin, and Stephen King. Dreams for Sale, the Twilight Zone 85 podcast looks back at that land of shadow and substance and re-examines the groundbreaking successor to Rod Serling's legacy. Featuring new interviews with the show's creators and cast, Dreams for Sale can be found on iTunes and at twilightzone85.com. Dreams for Sale. We'll be waiting for you in the Twilight Zone. 
how did you get involved with acting you know, and transitioning then into getting cast in President's Day and then WNUF? Oh, well, actually, I started out in college many years ago as an acting major. And um, but then I like one summer, I was like, I guess the first summer after freshman year, I was reading this article in the New York Times that said only one out of every 150 actors is ever working at any given point in time. And I'm thinking, gee, you know, I think I want a family at some point, and that's probably a lot of moving around. Maybe this isn't the right thing for me. So I became a television major. Not that far different, but I became a television major, and this is like uh, uh, early 70s. This is exactly when HBO and MTV's happening and all that. And like one of my classmates was became the producer for Letterman. Another one became like the vice president of comedy for HBO. But I chickened out and I went to law school. So, and I was in Black Sunday as an extra, you know, like in the 70s, but never did anything else with it. But then later on, I started actually getting involved with ballet at the Kennedy Center. I'm a big ballet fan. And I met someone online that said, hey, you know, you know, when ballet companies come to town, they need like background extra people to sort of stand on stage with a sword or be a waiter. I said, oh, that sounds cool. So I started doing that. And one of those times I met another guy who, abs- uh, who happens to be a member of the Screen Actors Guild. And I said, yeah, I wish I would have gone into acting. It's too late now. And he said, no, it's not. It's not too late because they need actors of all ages and sizes and looks. And I, well, what, and I said, what do I do? He says, well, contact these um, agencies, you know, the casting people in, 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 my, in the Washington, D.C. area. And I did. And I started getting like, you know, background things, you know, Flags of Our Fathers, Syriana, Veep, uh, The Wire, that kind of stuff. And that's fun to do for a while. But after a while, you think you want something bigger. So that's how. And then so I then started. There are a couple of things in D.C. area that, you know, give you listings of, you know, uh, jobs coming up. And I started applying for independent films. And somehow I came across Chris LaMartina and auditioned, and he cast me in President's Day. Actually, I've done five movies with Chris, and I think WNUF was the third, of the, the third, I guess, I did. Let me ask you, obviously, since you have worked on you know non-independent, quote-unquote, big-budget productions versus working on independent film, for you, which is more satisfying? Well, no question, the independent stuff. I mean, you know, being a, you know, a, a, you know, background and, you know, a, you know, it's fun to see famous people on set and be part of it, but you don't have any lines and it is acting to a degree, but it's not like, you know, something like WNUF where for a majority of the movie, I'm sort of the main guy in it and you get to speak and with Chris, you get to, add, especially in NUF, you know, a whole lot of ad living and stuff and that kind of thing. So there's no question the independent stuff is much more satisfying. Tell me, t- tell me a little bit about the the kind of the trials and tribulations of of getting the part of Frank Stewart in WNUF. Well, the, <laughs> you know, I've done. You know, as some directors I've worked with, they'll they'll hire me without an audition every time I've auditioned for Chris, even though he's worked with me a number of times, and and I think it's fine, and I think he should do it. You know, I right, Paul was good in this other thing, but. Can he really do this thing? But the audition for WNUF was interesting because it was like, um, you know, sort of an improv thing. They said, okay, you're this reporter. Tell us the highlight of your career. So I don't know. I just off the cuff, I came up. Well, I said, well, I was a reporter and I was working in Ohio and there was a a Ferris wheel that um, uh, stalled. You know, so the people were all stuck in the air and I was assigned to go do the story and I actually climbed up the Ferris wheel and interviewed people. And 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 um, Chris and Jimmy, his co produced loved I guess loved the story or whatever, but they hired me. And I think sort of because of that story I made up. When I spoke with Chris about it, he said that you had initially gone in and it wasn't you know it wasn't what kind of you had wanted it to be, and then you came back in and really kind of nailed it. But I think if I nailed it, it was because of that story. Or, you know, I, I forget the exact circumstances, but I remember them liking that sort of improv story I came up with. 
tell me a little bit about getting to work with Chris and creating the character of Frank Stewart and kind of what were some influences that you drew from to kind of bring to your performance as the character? Well, well, Chris, you know, the, the whole thing with WNUF, it's sort of reminiscent of that thing that Geraldo Rivera, Rivera did years ago with opening up Al Capone's safe. You know, we're going into a place, into this house where there had been this murder committed, and we didn't know what we were going to find, if anything. And so, and, and, he, and he suggested that, he wanted, you know, a little bit of Geraldo Rivera. Not that I should be mimicking him or whatever, but he wanted sort of, you know, a, a you know, a sort of a brash reporter, um, sort of quick on his feet and challenging people and that kind of thing. Um, but that was the one thing he'd mention was the Geraldo Rivera thing. But unlike, and, and Chris is, you know, a, a very good um, a, a screenwriter, and he really. Uh, normally likes things to be, if he wrote it a certain way, that's really sort of how he wants it. But this was a little different because there was a lot more ad living, ad living, and he gave me sort of more freedom to uh, play with the character a bit, which was fun. So what did you bring to the role versus kind of the Geraldo expectation? Uh, well, I think uh, there are several scenes that had a great deal of ad living. There's a scene in front of the house where all these revelers or Halloween people are there. And, you know, Chris said, you know, ask a couple of questions and then just sort of, you know, deal with them, you know, and, and I did that. Um, so I guess the ability to do that and pull it off is, I guess, what I brought to that. Because, you know, there are other, you know, actors or actresses that oh, I need exact lines. I can't, you know, really go outside my comfort zone. And I did have to go out my, outside of my comfort zone with this and, and just react to, you know, I'd ask a question of one of the people outside, and then I had to come up with something to respond to them. And I think I did that okay. I, I, think, it, I, I think it came off okay. Um, but it was fun to do, but I don't know if Chris mentioned to you that, that you know, there's a whole bunch of commercials in that thing. Obviously, I had no idea, you know, I had nothing to do with them. And those, I think, took longer to do than the, the, the uh, but we, all of my parts and all of the things in the house, we shot that in three days. And it was, um, you know, an intense three days, um, but it was, um, it was good to sort of just flow together real quickly and do it, and do it all. And it, it, I think it made it more natural. Yeah, so I, I am curious, kind of, what was it like working on that really kind of amended schedule and on that and on that set? It was cool, but it was intense, and I have to admit that you know, because there was so much going on and we were doing it in, in, in such a little amount of time, and the script was, you know, it's a full length movie. They actually hooked me up with an earpiece, and uh, Jimmy George, the co producer, was actually on the other end of it in case I messed up my lines or in case I needed a prompt or something. Um, however, I'm happy to say only once did I need it in three days. You know, I knew the lines enough and he, you know, he was, he was standing by ready to feed me the line or whatever. But luckily only once did I, did I falter and I needed Jimmy and I'm glad he was there. And it was sort of a nice security thing knowing that if I screwed up that they could fix it quick. That's impressive. <laughs> That's really impressive. I mean, you know, I, I can't begin to imagine being on the set with that kind of time constraint um, because it doesn't it doesn't show in the film for sure. It doesn't seem like kind of a slapdash production. So and no, and, and Chris is good at this. You know, he knows what he wants and he knows how to put it together and edit it to get what he wants. And what he wanted was, you know, an eighties. Um, um, local newscast, and that's what he got. And that's what he wanted with sort of a brash reporter who would talk back to people or kid around. And um, and, and I, I um, you know, I even won a Best Supporting Actor award at Atlanta Horror Quest for my role yeah, I... as Frank Stewart, even though arguably, you know, it was really a major actor role, not a supporting one. But apparently there was a guy in Atlanta who'd been nominated a bunch of times and they wanted to honor him. So they gave him best actor, but they liked me so much. They gave me best supporting actor. And I'm just very happy to be nominated. But yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm at a level with you, you know, um, 
the the character of Frank Stewart really holds the film together and and keeps it you know keeps it going. I mean, like you said, he is brash and kind of has some quips back and forth with the people outside and and then you know uh, kind of the burgers and, and everyone else in the house and even his kind of news crew that's outside. Uh, and and I I like that back and forth because like you said, it it does kind of convey that sense of the eighties. Oh yeah. I mean, it, it's not like that anymore in some respects, which no. I think is kind of indicative of the era we live in but i think like you said your your personality and the kind of the character that you Im- clearly embodied it does really come through and the other thing is you don't know whether he's really taking it seriously or not because sometimes he does and then later on as things get serious he clearly does but he's sort of you know playing with it a little bit at the beginning but then you and you don't really know where he sort of stands as to whether you know, this is a serious thing. Are they really going to find anything, or is it just something to do on Halloween? And um, it was an interesting character to play. Well, because I always got the sense, and this was just me spitballing, that your character was complicit in in kind of messing around with things on set to kind of get a reaction from some of the people, if that makes sense? It does make sense, although I don't think that was the intent. No, it's good if, you you know, if people have different, you know, oh, maybe he's messing with this. Maybe, he, you know, maybe one of his guys did kill the cat or whatever. But, no, there wasn't any feeling like that, that, all right, let's, you know, Chris didn't say, all right, let's make this sort of ambiguous where it's not clear if you're really part of it. Or, no, there was none of that, though. Right. That's kind of that's what I figured. Like I said, I didn't get that sense from Chris, but again, I think that works in the in the film's favor because like you said, he doesn't he doesn't seem to be taking it entirely seriously at the beginning. Right. And then later on, obviously, it really kind of ramps up and the horror aspect takes over versus kind of the comp the comedic aspect of the film. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Let's talk a little bit about that that transition from kind of comedy to horror in the film. Um when the tension does start kind of uh ramping up later in the film, kind of what was that like working in that kind of the last 30 minutes of the of your part of the film and kind of having to do some working with some of the practical effects and and some of the stuff that ends up going on in the house well it was much more intense because you know i didn't have anything to do with like the cat and that and i started getting you know as uh, the character started getting actually scared um which was a whole different you know uh, tenor from the earlier part of the mo- you know of the film where I'm, you know, sort of joking around and getting around and, you know, it's going to the house and see what's there and the, the priest and all that. But then, you know, someone killed the cat and I know my people didn't kill the cat. <laughs> so then something else is really going on and then going downstairs with the priest and all that. Uh, that was pretty intense and it required, you know, a, a different uh, a, a approach to the whole thing. Because I'm scared at that point, and I don't know what to do, and things are happening, and I don't have control of them, and I'm sort of scared. Well, and and again, I mean, it, it comes through because there is that tonal shift towards the end of the film where your character essentially makes a 180 and stops joking around, and I think that it, again, it it shows kind of the 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 quality of Chris's screenwriting and the quality of your acting. That it's it. it <laughs> You're welcome, right. Um, it, it's believable, and that's the thing that I think could have gotten lost, is that your character is believable throughout, and you kind of follow your character on that, that journey from, you know, the smart-ass to, you know... Sca- oh, scared-ass, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, scared-ass, yeah. yeah. No, but it was, a, it, was a, it was a fun movie to do, and apparently the, the reaction's been good. And, and they actually continue to show it at, at festivals, or it's actually going to be shown uh, in, in Virginia on, on Halloween. And I've never had a chance to see it in a theater. I've got the DVD, but I, and I didn't get a chance to go to the premiere of it in Baltimore because I was filming another movie that ran late, and I can't believe I, I couldn't go to it. But I've never seen it in a theater, but I'm going to get to do that like in a month. But have you seen it on VHS? That's the real question. <laughs> oh, sure, yeah. And I, I've, got, I've seen it on... I, I have one of the copies, the handwritten VHS labels, and I have the DVD. What is, what's your reaction to the reaction that you've heard about the film, you know, and, and kind of what's your response to the way people have received the film and your performance in the film? Well, the thing that's nice about it is there's, always, there's occasion every year, you know, to, to, 
to see it because it's it, it's so tied into Halloween. So every year there are it seems you know there are like articles on Google about it from different I guess horror sites and that kind of thing. You know I think there was even like a, you know oh what Halloween movie should you watch this year and they recommend WNUF even though it's you know four years old or whatever at the time. Um, and there have been some. Uh, you know, the other independent films I'm in really don't get reviewed um, like the horror world reviews films. And, uh, you know, it's very nice to see these very co positive comments that people have made over the last four years. And, you know, some of them didn't come up for a couple of years where someone reviewed it and really liked it or like my performance or whatever and recommends it as being, you know, and then there's some people that talk about every year it's a tradition of theirs to watch WNUF on Halloween. And that's really nice to know that there's some people out there that not only appreciated it when it came out, but continue to appreciate it. And have made it part of their yearly tradition. Yes. I'd let, yeah, I'm like part of the family. It's, yeah, it's, it's true. No, it's a very cool thing. So I wanted to ask you about something that was brought to my attention when I spoke with Chris, and it was something I didn't I didn't know about. Um, the the vinyl that was put out. The what? The vinyl. Oh yes. <laughs> the I didn't Chris. I didn't know about it, and but I wanted to ask you about uh, coming back to play Frank once again for uh, for a, a spoken word uh, entry into the Frank Stewart uh, experience, as it were. I, I'm looking at the album right now, actually. Um, um, uh, no, it was very cool. And, you know, I got to, you know, put on my resume that I did a spoken word recording, which was cool, but no. So one side of the album is me doing other stories. Um, the other side of the album are the burgers. And I, to be honest, I haven't listened to that side yet. I'm sorry, but, um, no, it was, it was cool to be able to sort of, you know, something that I thought was done with being able to sort of, you know, recreate that character in a, in a different, um, not venue or whatever you'd call it, in a different medium. Um, so that was very cool revisiting, you know, one of the, you know, my most favorite characters. So that was very cool doing that. All right, we are back. Big thanks to Chris LaMartina and Paul Ferencop for sitting down and talking with me. Let's finish up talking about WNUF Halloween Special. So from here on out, we're going to talk spoilers. If you haven't seen the film yet, please go watch it. It is fantastic. And if you do like it, go support Chris LaMartina right now. He has a GoFundMe page for the sequel. The sequel is going to be set in the 90s. He's been doing a hell of a lot of self-promotion on Facebook for it. It's Look, it's, it's independent film, folks. You got to hustle every day if you want to get this made. So hats off to him. Please go check check that out. He's been doing a hell of a lot of stuff. He's been releasing some kind of extra footage that he shot, which if you're a fan of WNUF, you probably want to eat that up as quickly as you can. So like I said, though, from here on out, spoilers. So Mike, I'm curious, what did you think of kind of the big twist at the end of the film? I actually didn't see it coming. So I was very happy about that. Like, I like that you get introduced to these nut jobs who are all against Halloween and that plays so perfectly into the satanic panic of the 1980s that you get those folks. And I mean, <laughs> they seem like they could easily be friends with the people that we talked about from Jesus camp, you know, <laughs> the, oh, the woman yeah. who is so against Harry Potter and, you know, you don't teach about warlocks. They are not heroes and stuff. And, you know, orange and, and black, or the devil's colors. <laughs> so I, I really, you know, it was nice that they inter interrupted the call in session. It was nice that they interrupted the, uh, the man on the street interviews that, that Frank is doing at one point. And yeah, when it ended up being them in the house, uh, that really worked well for me because I honestly did not see that coming. Well, and that's, I mean, again, you're, you're completely right. When I watched it the first time, I did not see it coming either. I honestly was expecting something a little bit more along the lines of there's a, there's an episode of Tales from the Crypt that's kind of similar to this. It's called like television terror, I think. And it's got Morton Downey Jr. in it. Oh, and I just expect, yeah. And I just expected Frank Stewart's character to just get killed by a ghost or like you, you weren't sure what it was. Uh, but again, all the credit to Chris LaMartina and Paul Ferencop for going the extra mile at the end of the film to really give us something that is breaks with the comedic 
value of because this movie's pretty funny. You know, there's a lot of parts of this movie that are pretty quotable. The commercials are pretty over the top. Uh, you know, French jets and makeup and the fucking frumpkis wine coolers is probably my favorite ad in the entire movie. But then you have this really horrific ending. And the really interesting twist is that this copy of the VHS that you're watching is the killer's VHS tape. Right. And that's such a cool idea and a novel idea for how to do a found footage ending. I mean, I'm sure it's not like completely original, but that doesn't mean anything when it's executed so well. Yeah, and the thing you were talking about, this is independent film, and when you realize, I think he says on the commentary it was shot for, what, $1,500 total? And it's like, this movie was so much more effective to me than something, and I'm going to offend people, but something like VHS and VHS 2. I could give a shit about those movies, and I will never go back to those pieces of trash. But this, so much more effective. And you know the budgets on those were so much more. And they probably had the digital effects and all this kind of garbage. And for movies called VHS, they didn't look like they were VHS. People would put VHS tapes into a VCR and then were allegedly watching what's on those tapes. They didn't look anything like VHS tapes, whereas this had that authenticity, that he ran this stuff through VCRs multiple times to to downgrade the actual video quality, the quality of the, the footage at the end when they're cutting off his tongue. I mean, that stuff is so rough, but it's perfect for it. Yeah, it's 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 rough, but like you said, in a way that really sells it. And that's kind of the big takeaway that I kind of have with WNUF is that when you go the extra mile to really give the audience a sense of time and place, if it works well, you essentially can do no wrong. And that's the huge takeaway here is, I mean, I, I mean, if the ending had been kind of, you know, generic and straightforward, I still would love it. But with the ending having this kind of really grisly twist, I love it even more because, again, like you said, it really works out the kinks of what it means to be a VHS tape. And it goes the extra distance to, even if you're just watching it on Shutter or you're watching a VOD copy of it on Amazon Prime on an HDTV, it still is only 4.3. It still is grainy as hell. And uh, and it just, it sells itself completely. And yes, watching it on VHS and my mind is the optimal way to do it because it again it just there's something to be said for watching this on vhs if you know what oh I mean. yeah yeah i can't even imagine like popping the tape into the machine hearing it unspool and then having that come up as the image it felt wrong watching this through a streaming service and seeing you know like having it go back to the menu at the end it was like no this should just play out as the rest of the tape and there's nothing on it you know like to the point where if this was on vhs i would be fast forwarding all the way to the end until it finally chunked and rewound itself because i'd still be looking for like more images did they record more onto this tape later on like give me more clues it's kind of like you mentioned cloverfield and the whole idea of like how the video goes back at the end because they were recording over somebody else's tape it's like watching that like you get this major clue of like oh you saw the creature splash down i would have been doing the exact same thing with this and it would have felt much more authentic you know the sad thing about mentioning this film and cloverfield in the same sentence is this film is superior to cloverfield in every way and it feels almost like doing this film a disservice to mention such an overhyped piece of trash well, you know, they, they have the Ed and Lorraine Warren analogs in this movie, and then they have them being portrayed in all of the uh, the Conjuring films, the, the Annabelle series, all that kind of stuff. And it's like I was much more on the edge of my seat watching WNUF than I was watching any of those Conjuring films. And, you know, I paid for the whole seat, but I only needed the edge. That's right. That's that's what they say in that commercial. Yes. And again, like, like we've said, and you know, this is something that I think really works in its favor, like you mentioned with the commercials. They don't feel overdone. No, because having had experience, I know how freaking crazy they can get. So that commercial for the quarry, the, uh, the rock music show that was fucking perfect man that was wonderful because i've seen commercials exactly like that when i was working at comcast and there was a guy there this like 500 pound 
super long hair rock and roller dude who went by the name of Mr. Bubbles and he made a commercial for his band you know playing at this local club and it was almost exactly the same all the cheesy video effects all this kind of stuff the over the top VO the rock and roll music it was I mean, Mr. Bubbles could have been part of WNUF Halloween special, but having the Corey there as this, you know, counterpart to it, I was like, okay, yeah, they, they were, they were so right on with so many of these commercials, that stupid carpet commercial that they show multiple times. And the whole idea of, you know, the sponsors buying multiple spots for the same, you know, uh, little bit of time period. I mean, it's, it's, it's the same now when you're watching on demand, but watching, shows back then you would see those same things over and over again i'm surprised there weren't more lawyer commercials you know the the politician especially watching this right now and i know that uh on the audio commentary chris is constantly saying like i hope you're watching this around halloween i hope you're watching this around halloween watching this in an election year and seeing all those political commercials it i mean it was so effective it kind of turned my stomach because i'm so like done with political commercials but they hit perfectly. And if they want to talk about his infidelity, I'm all for it. <laughs> like, it was such a prick. But again, it's it hits all those notes of kind of what I expect when I watch something from that time and place. Exactly. And also credit to Chris not being the one who did all the commercials. Though it sounds <laughs> like he ended up doing too many of them. <laughs> well, what I mean is, um, I mean, not being the one who made all of them. Oh, right. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Using all the pre-existing footage, getting stuff from uh, J.R. Bookwalter and, and other folks. And then he was talking about his editor. Um, I don't know how Final Cut Pro works, but he was saying that she made all of these uh, playlists of different themes, and then they were able to pull all that stuff together. So I'm like, oh, okay, that's really kind of smart. So then they would just have like all of these things. And I know he said in the commentary that some people say that the shot of the Twin Towers is over the top. But you don't think about that stuff in 1987. You're just going to put a shot of the Twin Towers in it. So I thought that that was really effective as well in the uh, Epsilon Air commercial. Well, again, it just goes to show kind of how far you're willing to go to sell what you're showing. Exactly. And again, it's not an issue then. I mean, again, you know, now everybody getting all bent out of shape. But, you know, there's a couple different directors and writers for some of the commercials, like the Parents Against Partying or hmm. the the Stacia tampons, which I think is one of the more effective, subtly effective ones, because it feels just like pitch perfect in every way. But like I said, I mean, my favorite one is still the Frumpkiss wine coolers, because it's just a the idea that anyone is selling wine cooler in this like glass bottle <laughs> that looks like something out of Dracula's crypt knowing that we have Boone Farm now that's just like the lowest bottom garbagey shit that you can drink but they're so they're trying to make it be this like really grand thing I think it's just the uh, the funniest thing ever and again I think that's probably my favorite ad but they're also pitch perfect and tonally consistent throughout that not one sticks out as like well that one was weaker than the others because it doesn't seem like it'd be from 1987 right I mean I personally would have liked to have seen more of the promo for S straight A's the show that they were promoing at one point I was kind of sad that they fast forwarded through the end of that but it just again it hits and the tv show promos i thought were so well done as well and some of those crazy names for them like chicago lightning and stuff it's like wow that fits well and yeah it's close to miami vice but it's not to the point where you're like groaning inside like oh that's too similar they separated stuff out enough where you weren't thinking like this is a direct ripoff and if you're watching shows on you know your local UHF channel, yeah, they had analogs for everything. It was like, here's the low-rent version of, I don't know, the A-team or something. If they called it the B-team, that would be a little too close. But if they called it like X-Force Alpha uh, Exelon or something like that, who knows? That commercial for the, uh, the sci-fi show, that was fantastic as well with those like – uh, the, those crazy great graphics and like the, the, um, bird of prey, the Klingon bird of prey in there. It was, oh, it was so good. And the laser brigade. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> My my favorite is the uh, the fake movie that they talk about, The Mummy. Oh, my God. Oh. Oh, that's, it's, again, it's just it works so well because it, it feels like, you know, that could be a real thing. And that they're switching, like, 
quality of video inside some of those and quality of footage so like that movie doggone it i was like okay that looks like it might have been shot on film at some point that was so well done and it was so smart the way that he gathered all that footage and just was able to reuse those things i mean that he was recycling himself so often you know and just like not holding his own stuff sacred and being like oh there's a shot of a mummy cool i get to use that right um so I'm I'm curious kind of what you think about like the the overall kind of way that this film kind of works in the the scheme of found footage. Is in your mind because again we talked a little bit about this on Ghostwatch, is this in the kind of the top tier of the found footage horror films, reality horror films that you've seen? For me, yeah, I would definitely put that in there. I mean, I might not have seen as many as I probably should, but I think I've seen a fair enough amount. Like for a while, I was very into found footage films and trying to see uh, as many as I could. But then after a while, it just got to be too big. There were way too many because for a little bit, it was like a novelty, you know, and you're like, oh, well, in 2014, they released 21. As we talked about on our Taking of Deborah Logan podcast, which came out in 2014, 21 found footage films came out in 2014, which is insane. And then you had found footage on television, found footage, you know, like on episodic stuff, found footage, you know, TV movies. So, yeah, it was it became too big of a mountain for me to climb. So I will not say that I'm any sort of expert when it comes to found footage stuff. But as far as what I've experienced this is one of the best. Yeah, and again, I think that a lot of the credit goes to Chris and his smart script and the 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 committing fully to what you're trying to achieve, having this idea in your head from the get-go that I want this to be a broadcast from public access, a local cable, not even cable, a local channel that you could pick up over the air. And this happened on Halloween, really unassuming. And because of the twist at the end, nobody knows what happens to the people, but the audience who's watching does. And I think that it's just when you put all those pieces together with the commercials, with the performances, with everyone committing, with at the beginning, there being like actual like news broadcasts about the guy who shoots the little Asian kid because he has PTSD. I mean, it's just, it's going out of your way to really sell something. And when he went, and because he went out of his way to do it, you get this really kind of like perfect little piece of found footage, horror, comedy, entertainment. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that's the thing that I talked about too on Ghostwatch is all those times where I think to myself, how is this working? You know, like I mentioned VHS earlier, and it's like, well, who cut these tapes? Who did this? And in here, you don't get that directly. You get that inferred, but it's perfect the way that it's inferred. And it just really pushes you into that way rather than you sitting there going, well, that doesn't make sense. And just that it has this, what's well, got the rhythm to it. And it's got the whole idea of this is a broadcast rather than, you know, this has been lost at the side of the road or something. So it's it works really well. I would say that this movie being as good as it is, it walked a very narrow line. And it was, I mean, on either side of you, you could have been a failure in one direction or another. And it's kind of a miracle that this is as good as it is. Because, like you said, it could have fallen into any of the traps that we've seen found footage fall into. And I think that that little twist at the end with you finding out that this is the VHS tape of the Harvest Psychos who killed Frank Stewart. I think that's just like a, an absolute stroke of genius. Would this still be, in my mind, five out of five without it? Depends on how it ended, but probably. But with that little stroke of genius, that little kind of stinger right at the end, it really pushes it into just this like weird area in my mind where it's like, this is one of those things I could just kind of put on in the background, leave it on, and I won't get bored of it. Because it's every time I've watched it, I pick on pick up on something different. And I think for something like this, that's a testament to the quality and the craftsmanship of the people behind it. Uh, so Mike, what would you give the WNUF Halloween special out of five? I would probably give this 4.5 out of five. Yeah, I would give it a five, a five, a solid five out of five. And I haven't given out very many fives this year because we haven't watched a lot of really good stuff. I mean, we'd watched good stuff, but horror movie wise up until October, you know, 
The Strangers, Pray at Night, pretty bad. The Nun, pretty bad. So finally getting to share these movies that I've been really excited to share with with the with kind of the, the podcast audience like WNUF or Ghost Watch. I think it's it's been this has been a really fun month, and uh, I'm glad that you got to watch this, Mike, because I feel like you of all people really appreciated this. Well, yeah, I'm really glad that you invited me on this episode. And like I said, I just completely flew under my radar. So I'm glad that you pointed it out, made me watch it, because I, I feel like I'm a better person for it. <laughs> well, that's that's not a bad thing. So, well, uh, let's take another break and we'll play a preview for the next Culture Cast. At the beginning, she gave me things. Perfect balance. Fix sleep. Oh, she wants to get inside of me. I can feel her. Oh, she can see me. When you dance the dance of another, you make yourself in the image of its creator. I'm not even here yet. <laughs> the dumplings incredible. One, two, three. The way she transmits her work. You have to decide what is it you want to be for this company. There's more in that building than what you can see, Doctor. You are living with us, dangerous people. Pray, Mazot. Pray, God. Pray, devil. Mazot tenebrarum, Mazot lacrimarum, and Mazot suspiriorum. Darkness, tears, <laughs> and sighs. You're making some kind of deal with them. That's right. On the next Culture Cast, we're going to be talking about another horror movie. We're going to be continuing horror movies through November. We're going to be talking about some Italian horror films in November. And we're going to start the month with a look at Suspiria 2018, the remake that's being lauded as the best fucking thing ever made in the history of horror movies, just like every other horror movie that's made by a indie studio and gets public attention from the mainstream. So I'm pretty reserved about Suspiria 2018, if you can't tell, and I think that that's probably not a bad thing. So but did you know Tilda Swinton plays a guy in the movie? She plays multiple roles. Whoa, fucking crazy. It's like Eddie Murphy and Nutty Professor. Jesus Christ. But uh, until then, where can people find you, Mr. White? They can find me with you over at over at the Cold Shack Tapes at coldshacktapes.com, where we talk about episodes of the Night Stalker, both the uh, 1970s version and the early 2000s version. And you can also find me over at my podcast, The Projection Booth, was at, which is at projectionboothpodcast.com. And if you can't get enough of me, you can also hear more of Chris and I over at Dreams for Sale, which is the Twilight Zone 85 podcast, which you can find at twilightzone85.com. Let's just say that Mike and I must really like one another. Or we do have like that the Penn and Teller relationship where we like working together but don't really care about one another outside of work. Is that what this is? I don't know. I'd like to think that it's a little bit more than that. I would too, because that's just always been weird to me when Pendulette's like, yeah, I don't think Teller and I have ever had dinner together i'm like what that's weird that's fucking i mean like kudos on them working you know a working relationship that's made them millions upon millions of dollars but it, it's like it, it kind of takes like the luster off of it like the same thing i've been watching a lot of MythBusters, and it's like those guys apparently can't stand one another well that like, comes through on the show 
Yeah, but I mean, in, on the show, it always feels more like a put on, and then when you find out it's in, it's real, you're just like, oh, really? So, but mine, my relationship with Mr. Mike White is not that Mike and I have met in person, and it was a uh, he is a, he he I consider him a good friend. So we we have a but we do have a lot of podcasts, <laughs> too too many podcasts. So uh, and you can follow me on Twitter at Culture Stash. Like Mike said, Colchak Tapes, Dreams for Sale. I have another podcast I do with my good buddy Mike. Wallace, aka Father Malone, where we talk about Tales from the Crypt once every two weeks, twice a month. That's called Chronicles from the Crypt. You can check that one out as well. Head on over to culturecast.com where you can find out more about today's episode. You'll find links over to iTunes where you can rate and review the show, and to Patreon where you can kick a couple dollars our way if you want to. Great. If not, I don't know, go support somebody's WNUF sequel. The money would go just about as far there as it would with us. You're supporting independent folks one way or another, so go ahead and do that. Big thanks as always to Eric for his intro-outro music, and we'll catch you on the next Culture Cast. Culture Cast.